Nicolas Pumuja is a transdisciplinary researcher in artificial intelligence and cognitive neurosciences. After obtaining a PhD in electrical engineering from the Université de Bourgogne, Nicolas moved to the field of cognitive neuroscience as a postdoctoral researcher in uh, Max Planck Institute and Goldsmiths University of London. He has studied the effect of rhythm in the rehabilitation of Parkinson's disease, as well as the time perception, musical performance in drumming, and involuntary musical imagery. In 2016, Nicolas joined the IMT Atlantic as an associate professor to engage into a transdisciplinary effort combining methods from neuroscience, deep learning, and graph signal processing. Starting 19, uh, well, this year actually, uh, from a personal interest, Farouja began to explore this concert conference performance. So this is actually the second time they are going on with the Brainstorms project, where Christopher Rocher is the key lead to explore musical imagery and improvisation from a scientific perspective. So as you see, Nico is now plugging Christoph to an EEG recording machine. Uh, EEG records electrical activity, so it's general cortical activity from the brain. Um, okay. uh, so, yeah. Christopher Rocher leads Nautilus Ensemble, which is a band of creative musicians and jazz improvisers based in Brest, France. Uh, we also have guests Craig Patterson and Thierry Amar. Nautilus Ensemble is a project supported by the Permanent Cooperation Commission from France and Quebec in partnership with the festival Soni Peril Populo in Montreal and Plage Magnetique. Russia has made many artistic projects around the creative music and has played with musicians from Canada and the USA, being an engaged activist, activist about international musical cooperation. Russia also comes with studies on artificial intelligence engineering and counts with a vast discography of around 16 records. Greg Patterson is a trumpet player, composer, and educator based here in Montreal. He's a musician specialized in free improvisation and experimental music. He actively leads his own band, the Craig Patterson Quartet Quintet, and plays in the collaborative noise duo Sound of the Mountain. Since 2011, Craig has released 13 albums ranging between composed material to improvisation for jazz, free music, country, and klezmer. And last but not least, Thierry Amar, he will be playing the bass. He started his musical career as a teenager exploring the electrical bass and the double bass early, later in his 20s. An interest in improvisation music follows soon after. Uh, he is one of the busiest bases in Montreal. He's currently a member of the Tesmer group Black Ox Orchestra, two free improvisation ensembles, Slot is the Love, Balalai Mechanique, and three rock post bands, uh, Molasses, A Silver Empty Scion, Godspeed You, Black Emperor. He also has a vast discography production of around 15 records. Something very special about tonight is that this is the first time these three musicians will improvise together. So, well, welcome. So just, just I stop, sir. Um, before we start playing, um, we need to, we're going to do one minute of silence, which is not dedicated to anyone, sorry. <laughs> I just realized that by saying that one minute of silence is always very weird. So it's just actually just acquiring the signal so that it rests a little bit. So you can see, for the whole reference, you're going to be able to see this. I hope it doesn't distract you too much. Um, you can get into the music and you can try to look whether you see anything interesting in it. Well, I'm going to talk more in detail a little bit about what you can do with this. So in the very beginning, right, when, when, when everyone is set up, we're going to start by just one minute of resting, and that's going to be a nice way for you guys to set into the perfect.
first person to decline to use this search interval, you will have to score us seven million more. <coughs>
but uh, it's a way for us to create music uh, in the real time, and uh, it's very uh, uh, it, it, all about the world. For I think for the beginning, from the beginning of the humankind, it exists, and uh, we can't. You can't listen to this in the, on the radio. You can't listen, find this. And the, uh, the, most of the way you can find music, but it's very. Uh, I, I travel a lot all over the world, and everywhere I go, I can do that. And it's a kind of music each time that is very different. So that's the first point. Uh, and the second point it, it was to explain that um, we are working. I, I'm living in Brest, this, uh, the city in France uh, that is near the ocean. And uh, we are uh, used to make connection with other cities in the world, like Montreal, for two years. We, we work for two years to meet musicians and to create music and to, to try to build groups between people from here and Brest, and that's why we are here. And uh, so you will explain after all this project, but perhaps you can say something about uh, what we play on this music or what is this scene in Montreal? What is the scene in Montreal? Yeah. Sure. I mean, actually, I played a concert last night um, with a drummer who is, must be in his 70s now, who is kind of at the front of um, what would be called free jazz or jazz labor from in Quebec, which was very much tied to um, Quebec nationalism in the late 80s or the 70s. And there's actually a long history of improvised music and free jazz in Montreal and Quebec, um, which is quite wonderful. Uh, in the mid-80s or so, there was a, a, a new record label and a kind of an organization that started at the time it was called uh, the Super Mammoths, the Super Grandmothers, but now it uh, changed its name to Super Music, but it's uh, been a long established kind of contemporary music and improvised music and outsider art form for many um, musicians based in Montreal and elsewhere in Quebec. Maybe about 10 years ago in Kremuski in the north, there was a, a man named Eric Roman who started this regional group called the Grand Group Régional de Musique Libération, something like that. Um, so. And then also in Montreal, we have this festival, Sony Pierre del Popolo, that's been at least 10 years now, uh, or, or longer. And in the early 2000s, they were one of the main venues. And uh, Casa del Popolo started to present this kind of music as well. So it has a long, very rich um, history. And there's a lot of this music happening in town in little pockets, as well as everywhere in the world, actually. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks for thanks for this wonderful music. I mean, we, we this project is a little bit of a, um, a new thing for us, for all of us. And it started as a side project that we did in Brest. And as Christoph travels a lot, especially travels every year to Montreal, we thought we could try to do it in Montreal as well. So I first want to thank the Convergence Initiative for letting us make, like letting us do this whole thing and you for being here. So this project has a temporary name, which is Brain Songs. And I'm not sure about this name yet, but that's the one we came up with. And as all temporary names, it's probably the one that's gonna stay in the end. <laughs> so well. So let's say it's an experimental concert where we're trying to investigate it in a state of improvisation. Uh, let me just try to copy my screen because I can't see it. Okay, it's better. Okay. <laughs> it is better. <laughs> Sorry. So, if you are from Montreal and didn't check Swanee Peri Popolo yet, I highly recommend it. It's a wonderful festival. It's going for like almost a whole month. And there's, actually, it's all happening in the same neighborhood, in the same street, right? Like the three places are close to each other Casa del Popolo, and I 
Don't remember the other names, Darosa. Sarosa and Vitrola. Sarosa and Vitrola. So it's a wonderful place. It's really good. And very varied, very diverse kind of performances on music and dance and different things. And the other logo here is Ensemble Nautilus. So that's uh, the ensemble that Christophe is the artistic director. It's based in Brest, but it travels a lot. So in, um, we, we started this collaboration as an art and science project. And so I have to warn you a little bit before the, the, the rest of this presentation that I figure that this presentation is going to start as a general public presentation for general public with no specific scientific knowledge. And towards the end of the presentation, it gets a little bit more technical with a little bit more of a geeky neuroscience and machine learning stuff. So I hope it's OK for you guys. But I'll do my best to make it as much understandable as I can. So as some of you may know, um, Montreal is actually a pioneer in the field of music neuroscience. So music neuroscience, the study of the influence of music on the brain, has had a lot of impact and started I mean, a long time ago, but research efforts are really focused since uh, Robert Satori and Virginia Penn have started the field in, uh, and created the Brands Research Institute, so the laboratory on, on brain and music in Montreal. And there's been also like the work from Daniel Levitin, who is not here as well, and also running labs, and who's become really, really mediatic on, on publishing work and also communicating to the general public on the influence of music on the brain. So we can see many, many different things about music on the brain. We know, Christoph has mentioned, that people have been improvising for since ages, since the beginning of mankind. And Music is a universal thing. It, it has played and still plays a really big social role, and it's omnipresent in our societies, especially with the age of digital digital music. That we have access to music really easily, and there's also many many evidence that music can actually help through restoring memories in Alzheimer's disease, or rehabilitation of walking and, and um, gait patterns in Parkinson's disease, or many many other therapeutic effects. So this presentation is not much going to be about all the different effects that music can have on the brain, but I just quickly mention, want to mention a few things. So we know from very like like by, like early work, but not, not that long ago, uh, that music actually engages the whole brain. So we would think if we didn't look at, like intuitively, you might think that music is something that is purely auditory when you listen to it, and maybe motor when you have to play music, but it goes, it goes much further than that. It actually engages the whole brain by, and by making different brain networks involved in many different cognitive functions talk together through, through connectivity, through co-activation. So motor part of the brain might be responsible for the movements, for fine motor movements, and the auditory cortices might be responsible for getting the signals, and then you would have you, we know that we have um, loops that engage the motor areas, between auditory and motor areas, that are able to, to correct the movement of the musician while he's playing, so there's like a feedback phenomenon. And of course, uh, other areas like emotional areas in the orbital frontal cortex, or more deeper areas in, um, in the emotional centers of the brain are involved in music perception. So this talk is not about music perception, but just I wanted to mention that pretty much the whole brain is activated when we play music or when we just listen to music. And there's many, many fascinating things we can do about imagining music or considering the effect of rhythm on the brain that engages rhythm perception areas, etc. The other very large field of research, subfield of research in music that has been investigating is the long-term effect of music, which we would call training-related plasticity. So the, the, the the idea and the intuitive uh, point would be is that a highly skilled musician has to develop very, very, very um, fine motor skills as well as auditory skills. So that has an impact on the structure of the brain as well as on the connectivity of the brain. So there's been numerous studies trying to see the impact of long-term training. So in this picture, you can see a study from the group of uh, Hervé Blatten in France from Goussa, published in 2014 showing that uh, with the different, we won't go into too much detail of this picture, it shows that different levels of training, so from beginners, like non-musicians compared to beginners, compared to intermediate level, compared to experts, has an increasing uh, effect of plasticity, plasticity in the brain, which means 
how much gray matter volume or like local density of gray matter is modified in different regions of the brain as a function of musical practice. So you have different regions which are mentioned here, which is the left hippocampus, the right supplementary motor area, right insula, uh, what we have, we have uh, superfrontal, inferior temporal, super temporal, and left posterior cingulate. So without going into too much detail into which, what do we know about these regions and what do we know about these regions with relationship to music, let's say that there are regions which are not only auditory and not only motor, also like centers involved, like which Relatively playable in emotional perception and so. So I just wanted to show quickly. This is a whole literature that is a very big and very large one. But music affects the brain in two ways. Brain activity related to music is widely spread in, in the brain. So it involves a very very large network of brain areas. First point and second point, music training has long-term effects on plasticity on, on the structure of areas. So in the in the frame of this talk and this presentation, we are interested in improvisation. So more recently, people have started to look at the improvising brain, so musical improvisation effects on the brain. So there has been in recent literature two main questions. So it's similar to what I've just told you about the effects of music in general on the brain. Uh, it is brain activity during improvisation. So is brain activity of a musical improviser special compared to brain activity of just playing music, for, instance, for example. And a uh, second question is, as well, training effects of improvisation on the brain, so plasticity effects. So, okay, you can read it well. On my screen, it is really small, but so this, this table that I've seen here are, is a summary of my, so it comes from this uh, review paper from Roger Beatty in 2015, and it summarizes the different types of paradigms and populations, sorry, Doing. Uh, it, it summarizes different types of paradigms and um, and populations that maybe I try to speak with this one. Okay. So just before. So this table summarizes different studies by telling which what type of. Let's see if this is better. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Thank you, Mister. Um, <coughs> So to study brain activity during improvisation, people have be, tried to do very simple things like comparing so that in the contrast, you can see this, this column called contrast. So this means that it's an experiment where they're comparing two experimental conditions, one which is musical improvisation compared to memory retrieval for the first, or that, for example, improvising melody compared to improvising rhythm. Uh, the first study is a between subject design, meaning that they've compared uh, apparently classically trained pianists with non musicians. Well, I mean, there's different things you can do improvise a melody versus uh, random movements. They've done that in this, uh, in this uh, Diamond Sandman movement study. And many studies have been comparing improvisation with memory retrieval. What does that mean? It means that I would ask Christophe to improvise in the first condition for a while, and then for another condition, I would ask him to play a melody he knows by heart, or, he, or a melody that he has just learned. Maybe I've asked, showed him a score. So that's, uh, that's the kind of paradigm that people have been using. So they've done that in MRI studies, you know, like you know, using functional MRI, so to look at brain activation during these kind of paradigms, and then compare the different uh, conditions. And using these kind of things, uh, because the brain activity during improvisation. The other range of methods that have been used, uh, that those kinds of paradigms, is to try to see the, the training effects. So is the brain activity of an improviser special? And is the brain structure of an improviser special? So by doing this, uh, BT has also uh, tried to summarize all the different um, areas of the brain that are activated in improvisation based on the, the table I just showed you before. So using this, using this knowledge, it's been postulated that some areas of the frontal part of the brain, uh, which are responsible, to in, responsible in inhibiting um, like planned knowledge, so, uh, would, would be reduced in activity during improvisation, meaning that people who improvise would have like, this kind of deactivation of networks of planned performance, which makes sense because you're trying to play in an unplanned way and you're trying to the performance in the instant instead of relying on long-term memory, which kind of makes sense. Um, there's also been a, 
few studies showing a relationship between brain activity and how much strain in improvisation you are. And that's the connectivity study, which shows actually how much regions of the brain talk together. And this kind of connectivity between uh, different parts of the brain, especially in the, also like what I mentioned about the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, seems to be correlated with how much training and improvisation people have. So this is all very interesting, and I think it's a it's very important work. This, the literature is growing, and more generally speaking, the literature on creativity is growing. Has been a lot of interest in this kind of literature. And in this in the current project, we're, we're taking a slightly different stance because we we think that the previous studies suffer from uh, a few limitations. First, seeing improvisation with this kind of comparison, like comparing improvisation with memory retrieval, is a bit of a reductionist bias. It's reductionist bias in the design, which means that you're directly comparing, um, considering that actually it's, um, it's either you're improvising or you're not. So it's, very, uh, it's, it's, it's a very reductionist way to say things. And it's also reductionist in the analysis, which means that uh, this trust, which is a, like statistical comparisons, pretty much, of improvising versus memory retrieval. And it doesn't consider something more natural, more ecological, which is my second point. This kind of studies suffer from a lack of ecological validity. What I mean by ecological validity in this context uh, is, uh, how can I say, improvisers in the wild, <laughs> which means I would take these guys and, I mean, it sounds a bit like we, we're, we're, we're studying animals, but I mean, that's the point. <laughs> so what ecological validity? So what do improvisers do when I just let them improvise? And that's what we do in this project. And I try to explain a bit better why, but um, in a way, ecological variety is, is, is just, just to strengthen this point a little bit more. In, in what you just seen, I didn't ask them anything about what they should do. Just let them play. And they didn't know what they're going to play beforehand, and they played two pieces. And that's it. I mean, not trying to say, okay, maybe we should do first a quiet piece, and then maybe you should do a happy piece or whatever. I mean, and I don't think we would have liked if I say that anyway. So that's what we're trying to tackle in this project. And to to strengthen a little bit more this point, actually, there is a a paper from MacPherson and Lim published in 2017 with this following quote: "We argue that studying creativity in a way that is both scientifically and ecologically valid." requires collaboration between neuroscientists and artists, which really much motivates what, what, what we're doing here. So why a collaboration between scientists and artists? Well, the questioning is, is symmetric. The questioning is both ways. Can artists, can artists help scientists, scientists to generate hypotheses on the nature of improvisation? And the converse way is, can scientific outcomes enrich the creative process of the artist? So this project was born with the meeting between Christophe and myself, and that's the thing. Christophe has been recording his performances for a while, so he has had a scientific approach to his own playing. And so I think that's why Christophe was attracted to putting a bit more science into his, in, into his way of analyzing himself. And on my side, well, I'm also a musician, and I also think that for the sake of ecological validity, in case in this case, it's, I think it's, it's a good idea to try to include to include scientists, to include artists, to try to generate hypotheses. So what are we trying to do here? The, the hypothesis in place is the following. So it's, it's a different. There's a range of hypotheses, let's say. So we we believe. I mean, we we, we want to test whether improvising is not something that is an on and off switch, but it's more a target. It's more like a target state in which the musicians try to put themselves in. And they try to put this, themselves in this state to be able to have a musical target. So that's the thing. It's not trying to be, okay, not trying to say, okay, now I'm improvising, but it's more like I have a target. I'm a professional musician. My target is to play music, which I... So this is something where you would have to have me. <laughs> Sorry, but you, you, your target is to play concerts. Let's say that. So the, it's not like having a specific objective, but more a state in which you put yourself in to be able to achieve this target. Um, in the same, in a, in, a, in a slightly different way, we also think that improvisation is a bit more of a comp improvising is involves complex and continuous combination of different cognitive functions. It's not like 
you need to be able to do this, and you could right? But it's more like a, something moving, which is not just one direction, but a combination of different things. And we want to test whether such functions, cognitive functions related to improvisation, can be probed by having instantaneous subjective reports and neurophysiology. So I'm going to explain a bit more in the next slide, and probably this seems very obscure if I just say that. But essentially, the project, this project is also possible because Christoph has is this ability to think back on his performance. So to listen to it and to be able to kind of replay in his head the different states he was in. I'm going to detail that. And the specific hypothesis we have in this project, which is directly related to, to something that happened between Christoph and myself, is that those states we're looking for are related, it's an hypothesis, we're testing it. These states are related to subjective time perception and flow states. So what is flow state? Flow state is uh, the flow, the creative, creative flow. We're talking about a state in which you don't, the, the, the artist is into his art and is not thinking about anything else. That would maybe the most, just the simplest definition I can have of flow state. And subjective time perception would be something more about predicting very, very short durations in time or longer durations in time. So how do we set this up? Well, first, a bit more research questions. What can musical improvisation tell us about spontaneous brain processes? This is something of general interest that we want to like a bit of a bigger picture on this project. Can we relate inner states of an improviser to musical outcomes? So if we are able to measure those things related to flow states and time perception, can we make sense out of those states with relationship to the music itself? And can we relate brain activity to those states of an improviser? So it's very challenging because if we want to do this, we have to do it in an ecological way, which means we have to do it in just let them play, which is, well, very viable, very noisy, and we're measuring, we're measuring all these different things, so it's very multimodal, it's naturalistic, it's not in the lab, etc. So it's difficult. So the way we tackle this is by doing it on a single subject, which is Christoph. And we do many repetitions. And using this data that we collect, we try to combine that with predictive approaches and machine learning. So to be a bit more accurate on the methods, we have, this is a single subject study on Christophe Rocher. We did early pilot experiments and interviews to refine the protocol. And for each session that we do, so we've done so far six rehearsal sessions and three, three performances, but well, two performances in the same day and one performance today. We record audio, so that's why you have microphones here. We record EEG using this very simple, cheap, open BCI device, five electrodes. It's less than $500. And we record audio on EEG, and each recording is followed by re-listening and retrospective rating. So normally we would do it now. We decided to not do it now. We'll do it afterwards, after we talk. Uh, so what happened is that Christophe listens to the performance again. And while he listens, he's trying to annotate the performance in, ter in terms of how much he was into a flow state. So it's a continuous measure. It's a continuous rating. So he's listening and he's trying to replay his head how much he was in flow state at each second, each moment. And he's trying also to break to, to annotate uh, subjective time perception, which means is he thinking into very, very short durations or is he thinking into larger, longer durations? And that's an hypothesis we're testing. We think that these two things are related to something related to a brain state of improvisation. So we're trying to make sense of these two things. So what does it look like, this rating? So it looks like this. Uh, let you focus on the first left part of the, of the uh, this slide. So this is a full performance, so it's about 800 seconds, so it's uh, about 20 minutes, and uh, 15 minutes, and this is a uh, 1,000 seconds. So this is two performances we did in Brest on the 16th of March, and this is the result of Christophe really sending to it and doing this inst instantaneous rating, instant instantaneous um, assessment, let's say, of the performance. In terms of focus, which is flow state, the same thing, we're still, we're still using both curves. And subjective duration. So if this, uh, so the curve in blue says how much it was into a flow state, so when it's up, so maximum is 127. So when it's up, it means it was very focused. When it goes down, it means that maybe it was distracted by something, it was thinking about his fingers, or it was like not focused on the music. 
And the orange one is about the, so this thing about the length of the, the interval. So I'm not sure in which direction you're doing it. When it's very low, is it like you in the short, short durations or with it's not, uh, it's, it's very, um, it's rapid when, when, when it's, it's high. Okay, so it's short duration when it's high. So this area is when it's thinking into very, very short, so like it's reacting to very, very small, very short notes. And when it's down there, it means that it's more into this very... Like, okay. it's not, it has nothing to do with the long... But it's, it's, not it's, it's not the long note. It's not the length of the notes. It's not necessarily. It can be something else. Actually, this thing is also happening when he's not playing. So it's really trying to characterize what is happening in his head. So this, the center panel is the same thing, but on a 2D representation. So the focus here and subjective duration here. And the color here just gives you the, the moment in the performance. So in the beginning, it's, it's black, and then it goes green, and then at the end, it's yellow. So it's doing that. <laughs> so that's the kind of a trajectory. And this, well, I'm, I think I'm, I'm, I'm a bit running out of the time, so I'm not going to explain it. I can explain it if you have questions. Uh, just for the curious people, not the ones on the left there, it's a similarity between uh, the rate, between the ratings. We can talk about it later. So one thing you can try to do here is to say, okay, maybe there are actually regions in this thing, in this 2D thing. We can try to see whether the, whether this can cluster into like meaningful parts. And that's what we've done. So this is the result of trying to very, very naively, so this is very preliminary, just, just showing it for illustrative purposes, let's say. So this is just the result of, of, of running a simple clustering algorithm, which tries to tell you, okay, this cloud of points in the same color is actually something that is uh, similar with itself, which means that this region is a region where he is highly focused and with a very short duration. This region is a highly focused and a less medium kind of duration, and this one is like a short duration, highly focused. So that's something could have to, this is something that could have something to do with improvisation because we're trying to directly see whether the ratings make sense and are they reproducible. So we can test both of this like this. We can do it in we can do it across performances. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to see whether this kind of thing makes sense. So if you visualize this this cluster center, so to say, you have these three guys, which is this. Uh, doesn't have names, it's like crystal 2, 0, and 3. There's like high flow, short subjective duration, high flow, medium subjective durations, and high flow, long subjective durations. So, I'm not sure if you have time, but I can make you listen to what it looks like, which means that we can take examples of this, examples of this, and examples of this in the music, and that's the interpretative part, which means that if I trust him, can I make sense out of his ratings? So, let's see what it looks like. Uh, so, just be careful it's not too, too. So this is supposed to be cluster two, which means short duration. Well, if it's the same sense, yes, it's. So what you're hearing is a random collection of points that belong to this cluster. Which means that he's, in this sense, he's like reacting to very short things that are happening. If I got it correctly, yeah. this is okay. Okay, cool. So that was the short duration. The medium ones sound like this. Different 
instruments because we've done it, we've done it with many different musicians actually. The only, the only common point is Christoph, but we've done it with many, many different musicians. Well, maybe six, seven different musicians. <laughs> get the idea. So this is all, like the very first steps. What we want to do next is to try to actually use the ET data. So we didn't really use it so far, and I'm sorry I don't have more data to show you today, but what you've seen on the screen before, uh, maybe I can, I still have it actually. I can, yeah, this. Just I'm gonna comment a little bit on this. So the left part is the signal, the direct, like the, the signal, the raw signal from the five electrodes. And the right part is the spectrum analysis. So it's a, it's a time frequency analysis, which gives you kind of the power in different frequencies. So we have specific hypothesis here, because the literature has shown that flow state might be related to low frequency oscillations, especially the alpha, uh, high alpha and low beta band. So that's one thing we're going to test. So we can, we can try to relate flow state to this to really using a very simple correlational approach. But then the, the more challenging part would be to try to predict the retrospective ratings using brain oscillations. So using this kind of hardware, it's quite unlikely that we're able to do it, but with time we might acquire other hardware and be able to, to, to do more, more fine grained analysis. So it's an important question because if we are able to predict the ratings with the oscillations, it means that we can get rid of the ratings because we can we can just derive them by looking at the brain, which in a way would, would show that we are able to detect states from the EEG signal, from neurophysiology, that are meaningful in terms of the inner state of the musician. And then we can try to see whether the states that we're able to detect using the kind of clustering I've shown you, whether those states are musically meaningful. So that's the, the final step, so to say, if we can merge the EEG part and the ratings part and try to interpret this into the music. Because that would, that would do an interesting step towards the analysis, that, towards the hypothesis that we have, which is that improvisation is a target brain state. It's, not, uh, it's, it's a target which is a musical target. So if we're able to relate something from the inner subjective part of the improviser to music, then in a way we have shown an interesting neural correlate. So this is all going to be an open data project. So if some of you are interested in contributing or collaborating on this data analysis, where well, you're very welcome. You can talk to, you can come and talk to me. I've not released it yet, but I plan to do it. So we're going to release each data, audio data, and the ratings data. So pretty much all the data. And we have more references in France that are scheduled, and follow-up projects with Nautilus, including a project with a bit more of a. Um, let's say, a conventional way to use EEG in music, which is trying to directly use the EEG signals from, from Christoph while he's playing to, to make music. So he has a duo with uh, Sylvain Tegna, which is called Boreal V, and in this duo, they're planning to use the EEG signal in the performance, so really integrating. So it's a very different take, because it's not really a scientific objective, it's more an artistic way to use the EEG. And by the way, I'm sorry if some of you guys showed up and thought that this is what this is what was going to happen because it's not. <laughs> sorry, but the other performances are planned for this kind of things. So music generation with EEG. So that's it. Thank you very much. I want to acknowledge my colleagues at Cynthia Atlantic and uh, the Lab Stick, the France Quebec collaboration, which made it possible because of the, uh, the collaboration with musicians, as well as the Convergence Initiative. And a special thanks to the people from the EEG Sync software because they've been really helpful in setting up the software using EEG Sync for real time music, uh, like real time analysis of EEG, uh, especially Robert Ustenberg and Stephen Whitmarsh. And I also want to thank Guillaume Dumas and Nathalie Regard because they've very, very generally inspired me in doing open science and uh, science and art projects. And thank you very much, and I would welcome your questions now. System, like how exactly, what were the modalities of the rating? Okay, so uh, so the way we do it is, I mean, the way we operate, operationalize it 
I mean, it's really straightforward. It's just um, Christoph listens to the performance we just recorded. So we try to do it as close as possible to the performance. And we do it with a, with a very simple MIDI interface. So it's just like a 0 to, 107, 0 to, 0 to 127 score. And he do it, does it instantaneously, which means that he's really trying to replay the state that he's been in. So he's trying to figure out while listening, while listening to his own performance, he's trying to, to figure out when I played this, was I currently focused, and how much of my time perception was short or long. That's so, so it's a continuous reading, which means that there's no when the temporal resolution is something like I don't know, I would say a half a second or something. I mean, we, we record it continuously, so technically it's more than that, but the actual temporal resolution that you're able to do is probably not more than three or four times a second, I guess. I quantify it to one per second. I mean, I could do different things, but I think what you see here is quantified on one rating per second. So every second, he's trying to replay in his mind while listening uh, how much in flow state he was and how much uh, of was he thinking in short duration or long duration. Does that, does that answer the question? Yes. Okay. Cool. Uh, how did you decide on the number of clusters? Ha, good question. Um, elbow method? Sorry? Elbow method, if that rings a bell. <laughs> okay, uh, I think I have it here. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, wait a second. I do have it here. My nice elbow. Yeah, there we go. So, I mean, right, it's a bit more of a technical machine learning point, but uh, you can test for different number of clusters and just stop taking more clusters when you see that the gain is not much. This is a really simple, the most naive way you can imagine clustering. It's k-means clustering. Um, we could do more fancy things by actually exploiting the, the similarity matrix on the right here. If you're into machine learning, you, you should, I mean, I think you can do, so we could do spectral clustering based on, the best, based on this matrix, or we can we could imagine other, other ways to decompose the data. And something I've done in another project is to use a, a DB scan, which is a method which enables you to detect the number of clusters that you should use. And it also is able to get rid of the noise. So that's one of the things I plan to do, but I just didn't have time to do it yet. Hi, thanks. Um, so, uh, a distorted perception of time is one dimension of the, the flow uh, cons construct. It's a different one, actually. We have flow yes. and time perception. Yeah, but in so it might be well, I mean, I, I, it might be correlated, but we it doesn't seem so actually. Okay, but in, in the definition of flow given by uh, Shiks and Mihai, mm -hmm. uh, a distorted perception of time is one of the seven dimensions. Okay. I remember. Okay. So. How, yeah, why, why did you choose to, to so we, separate these two? Uh, okay, so maybe, so, so, okay, so maybe Christoph was right then. <laughs> because actually we didn't call it flow in the beginning. As you can see still here, I think it's called focus. Yeah, it's still called focus. So maybe you're right, maybe it's not really flow, maybe it's more something about, so I, I don't know the seven dimensions yet, I'm not an expert in the flow literature, but maybe there's one dimension which is more about whether you're into the creative flow itself or not, which means that Christoph thinks there is like a focus, like attentional focus related to, I'm not sure if it's attentional because actually, well in French there is a word that I miss in English, I'm sorry, it's lâcher prise. Uh, does anyone know how to say that in English? Let go, yeah, letting go, letting go of things. Um, yeah, so that has something more, something to do with that with letting go. So whether is into playing, into improvising, like not thinking about the music at all. Well, not thinking about the technicalities of music, let's say. Not thinking about the... You, you can comment yourself, of course. If you have questions for, for the musicians, please, please do. Please, and please it's, ask it's a question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, not just to precise, uh, for me, that this kind of music, we have to be in the present. Uh, my purpose is not to be in the past, and not to be in the future. And if I'm in the present, I don't have to think about anything. And that's why I call for me 100% focus. Uh, and the music comes. I don't, I, I'm not a scientist, I can't explain, but I love this state, not to think. 
just be the music and uh, it's difficult to explain dif differently. It's not my, my job, it's yours. <laughs> Because I'm also initially an engineer, so I'm not very, very accurate all the time on the psychological aspect. But I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Hi, I have a technical question. Can you go into uh, why you chose five VAG channels and why those specific five? Okay, so it's really to get started. There's no specific about this is about frontal electrodes. So right now we have three frontal electrodes. Uh, so FP1, FP, uh, FPZ, FP1, FP3, and then kind of this most of them grouping. And that's it. And it's more uh, because that was the cheapest device that was easy to set up, that we had at hand. In the future, of course, uh, if possible, if we get access to, to better recording equipment, I would, I think one of the things I would like to do is to have electrodes over the motor strip to be able to see motor preparation. Uh, so like beta beta signalization prior to movement. I think that's one of the more like something something else I would like to investigate. So there's no so far. I mean, this is a headband that open VCI sells out of the box, and I only had an open VCI amplifier. I have another one, but it's more bulky and difficult to set up and a bit broken. So in the end, I, I for the first series of performance, I'm just using this one. So, so there's no like a specific reason. Well, no, but we can actually, on the same amplifier, we can plug up to eight electrodes, and I can also fit other electrodes, so I can look at occipital activity, so we'll adjust this, you know, which is not optimal, of course. We would like to have more things up there, and something that I plan to do in the future as well is to have other electrophysiological signals, like uh, ECG, so cardiac signals, which, which might also be interesting. I might be mistaken, but I think you were getting. Some, Sorry. I might be mistaken, but I think you were getting some beta activity in channel two, more than in other channels. So, the order that you saw was, I think one, two, three, four. No, uh, no, actually one, two, three, four, and FPZ was uh, FPZ, FPZ was the center, the five one, the fifth one. So I think left temple was getting more beta activity than the other channels. Was it? Okay. Yes. You, 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 could, you could notice it in the... I, I was checking, like, comparing when he was playing and when he was resting. That was the one that was getting more... Okay. Well, thanks for the insights. I mean, I didn't know the idea, but it's it, actually. We can look at, okay, look into it in more, in more detail, of course. I mean, the data team. Cool? Yeah? Um, yeah, I was also curious about that. And since you're using mainly frontal electrodes, I was wondering to what extent you find, like, myograms or blinking artifacts. Yeah. Your signal does that is that a problem? Of course, it is. Like, <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. How do you so, plan to deal with that? Is yeah. That question. Okay. So the I, I mean in the future, I'm, if possible, there's really nice uh, near FNIRS and EEG combined devices that we might want to have a look at because then when combining both signals, it's it's an easier way to get rid of artifacts. From the very first test, I could do. I mean. Of course, this is continuous data, so you have to analyze it with source separation algorithms like ICA, but I'm thinking about something, I mean, maybe trying other things like ICA. As we're using many, 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 a lot of data on the same subject, there is a hope that we can actually do specific sessions where we only measure artifacts and we try to remove them. And briefing artifacts are interesting, actually. We've done a session where we're trying to see, because it's, so it's, it's sometimes doing continuous briefing, you may have noticed that, and uh, there's this very brutal way of, of like, this kind of thing. And this is like, yeah, this is something that really shows up in the data. It's a bad news, but at this time it's a good news because it seems very systematic. Like every time this happens, this seems to be very, very, very useful. So, I mean, source separation with five electrodes, you can of course only separate five sources, which is not the best thing, but uh, we'll see what we can do. I hope I can give you good news. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so my question is, uh, uh, you're, you're saying you are to predict the state using the signals. Mm -hmm. So uh, after that, I would have you thought about using some other technology like TMS to induce certain states? Wow, that would be fun. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't thought about it. Uh, so Christophe probably doesn't know what TMS is. 
It has a very scary, uh, it is a very scary iconic. It means transcranial magnetic stimulation. I don't want. <laughs> I was absolutely sure. So, um, so honestly, um, so I, I, I switched fields in, and, and started to study and work in new science when I started my postdoc in 2010. And I figured out very quickly that stimulation techniques is something that probably I wouldn't want to do for myself. So I don't want to do it on others anyway. So that's my like, honest answer to the question. So that probably my personal bias on why I will not do that. Um, if I really ask myself the question to do it, uh, how? How would we do it? Uh, I mean, we're measuring EEG, so how can we, well, I mean, well, I don't know enough about CMS to know, to, 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 to give you a good answer, but I'm not sure how, I mean, okay, is it possible like to reduce or augment certain frequencies using TMS? Yes, probably. So I know that people are using uh, TMS for certain treatments for depression or and we, with specific targets on spectral activity, but TMS to induce flow states, is that, I mean, I personally don't know about that, but maybe there are actually literature on that, TMS to induce flow states. Maybe, I, 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 would, I, would, I would rather see it as a neurofeedback perspective, actually. So if I can find a way, if we can find together a way to identify states which are related to improvisation, maybe we could set up neurofeedback paradigms with musical feedback, maybe. And that's actually the other project with Silva that I was mentioning before, Boreal B, where you integrate EEG signals into music, into music production, per se, so to the musical objective. Maybe that would be a way, and I think that's the point that is of interest for Christophe, is that he thought that maybe by feeding the EEG signals into Sylvain's hardware, so into his partner's hardware, he can find a way to reach the states with this feedback loop with music. So more on your feedback perspective than the stimulation perspective, for if, I, if that makes sense. Okay? Have you done tests on uh, how to focus? We can use the brain as a tool to uh, change parameters while we're playing and uh, for live modulation. Okay, awesome. Um, well, so that's one of the things we could do with the project with, uh, with uh, Boreal Beep, with the dual project. Um, I think, I mean, the easy thing you can do with OpenPCI is to just get the spectral activity in all spectral bands and feed that with OSC into, uh, into live music software like Uzin or Ableton or stuff like that. So I think that's what they plan to do actually. We've not started the experiments yet. I'm not sure where to, when we're going to start that. End of the year, a bit before. We have a residence. We have a, the residence is in April or something like that. In Reims. Uh, uh, we have the, the end of the story is April. So we will be the end of the story is in April. So we should be in December. <laughs> Hi, yes, uh, I'm from uh, both neuroscience and music fields, and I'm not sure to to know what to take from the clusters that you showed us, like the and then the auditions that you gave us. So, um, could you please re-explain or explain in other words? Okay. Yes. So, uh, to be fully honest, the clusters. I mean, the musical extrapolation of the clusters is not very systematic so far. So, um, okay, if, we if you just take this picture, can you see the cursor? Yes, okay. So if you, if you just take this picture, this is focus, this is subjective duration. So let's say, to simplify things, that we're only interested in periods, in periods of time in which Christophe is highly focused. So you can forget about all the left part of the graph. We just want to look at this. So the clustering algorithm here kind of divided the data into one, two, three, four clusters. Okay, uh, why not? I mean, you can probably achieve a much better clustering than that. But let's say that it corresponds to a, a cloud, a cloud point, which seems to reflect something similar with, each, with, with, with itself. 
So which means that this is a region where it's highly focused and with uh, short durations. Is it always focused? Yes. This is a region where it's highly focused with medium duration, and this is more a region with highly focused on sh long durations. So the idea is that as every single of these points correspond to one second of music, we can listen again to this one second of music and see whether it makes sense. Is that, is that okay? Yeah, I'm good with that, but then when we listen to the extracts, I, I didn't see the... Yeah, I didn't so, hear, like, the... so we have to spend the significant yeah. effort in, in trying to really see whether that's musically meaningful. Okay. And there's lots of parameters that you can play with, of course, but from the early explorations we've done, I mean, at least for Christophe, it makes sense that, yes, when I hear this except of music, I know that this corresponds to a time in which I'm thinking into short durations or long durations. The actual challenge would be to predict something about the music using the, this data on the ratings. I'm not saying we're going to generate music or I'm not saying we're going to predict music because this is clearly not the point, but uh, more, I don't know, like a global density, spectral density or timber, like occupation of space, mm -hmm. spectral space. We could try to see whether there's some associations with musical descriptors. So if you're familiar with MIR descriptors, for example, something that you can use to, to, to try to, to characterize music. Audio, so really like audio descriptors based on combination of frequencies and, and stuff like that. So we would not try that. It's something we, we plan to do as well. So I would like, uh, we close the questions for now, so you can come and, and ask directly to, to Nicolas. Uh, so I want to thanks to Nicolas, to uh, Craig, Thierry, and Christophe for the performance and the talk today. Um, and thanks for coming. And please keep uh, connected to us because we are uh, offering these type of uh, talks uh, every two or three months. So keep in touch with us with convergenceinitiative.org. Please, if you have the forms, finish the second question that is after the, the, the performance and just let it here so we can take it after and don't forget to sign the consent if you want to be using. Thank you so much. Thank you.